All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program. I'm Emily. I'm one of the librarians here at Welcome Public Library, and we're thrilled to be hosting today's talk. Uh, I want to start the afternoon off with a couple quick programming notes on virtual events upcoming this month at the library. Uh, next week on May 20th, Arisa White will be discussing her genre binding poetic memoir, Who's Your Daddy, as part of the Maine Humanities Council World in Your Library series. And the following week on May 27th, art historian Dr. Michael Grillo at UMaine will be talking about the great plagues of the 14th century and how uh, there's some ties that link it to the current pandemic. And I'm happy to introduce tonight's speaker. After starting out in the National Youth Theater of Great Britain alongside Daniel Craig, Richard Burrow left treading the boards and went behind the camera. Initially at the BBC, Richard has gone on to produce and executive produce a range of drama shows for primetime transmission in the UK and internationally, including Waking the Dead, winning an International Emmy, Robin Hood, Filth, The Mary White House Story, The Invisibles, All the Small Things, Framed, Silent Witness, Strike Back, all Creatures Great and Small, and Alex Ryder. And I'll turn it over to Richard. You go right ahead. Hello, everybody, including, I can see from the names, um, uh, some of my family as well, who clearly want to tune in to find out what I do for a living. Um, and just hearing that there's a talk coming up about a plague in the 14th century uh, sounds rather fun, so I might tune in for that. Um, thank you for joining me. It's my evening. I'm talking to you from a hotel uh, in Evesham, in England, because I'm currently filming season two of Alex Ryder, uh, which goes out in the UK and Europe on Amazon Prime and over in the US on IMDb TV. And we started filming in mid-January, deep in uh, COVID time, and we'll finish shooting in mid-June. But I'll come to that a bit later, because that also uh, is an adaptation of books, books by Anthony Horowitz, a very successful young adult a series of books that we are now adapting. Here we are on season two with the promise of uh, future seasons to come, which is very exciting. But let me start with a little background on me. Um, and as Em said, uh, and I always put in that Daniel Craig bit because that's my only claim to fame, which is that I, at the age of 19, I shared a hotel room in Moscow uh, with Daniel Craig on uh, a theater tour with the National Youth Theater. And I haven't seen Daniel Craig since I was 20. So that is the end to my claim to fame, but there we go. But I did start out at school enjoying doing school plays. I loved it. I didn't really like rugby and cricket and things like that, but I liked doing school plays. And so I thought I wanted to act, which probably terrified my parents. Um, and, but, but getting into the National Youth Theatre, which is a, uh, a nationwide, as the, as the name would suggest, amateur theatre company at the age of 16, and he did courses up in London and then uh, did theatre tours, as I said, uh, internationally, but also put on shows in London. Uh, and that was a very good training ground for, for that discipline, if that's what interested you. Um, but my parents were very keen that I got a degree and I didn't throw everything in there. So I then went to university uh, here in England and did a degree in English and drama. And by the time I came out from that, I really had sort of decided I didn't want to go. Uh, into the world of acting. I don't think I had the patience. I was never going to be the good looking young lead. I can remember in the National Youth Theatre, and as I say, I was there with Daniel Craig and Tom Hollander and Rupert Penry Jones, who's another very successful uh, actor over here. And, and there was a certain amount of honesty in that company. And they said, you'll make it, they said to me, but not until you're much later in your thirties and you'll probably be the villain. Uh, and I'm not sure I really had the patience to wait around for that. And by then I had uh, a great deal of interest in, uh, well, I'd ended up writing sketches when I was at university, comedy sketches, but I was interested in sort of going behind the camera and seeing how shows were made. So I wrote lots and lots and lots of letters, uh, as you did in those days, to the BBC and to independent production companies. And I got two replies. I think out of about 45 letters, I got two replies. And both said, do, do come in for a meeting. And I went in for meetings and both afterwards said, well, you're very nice, but we have nothing. And, um, and then one of them got in touch two weeks later and said, our runner, and a runner is a gopher, someone right at the bottom of the chain, is, uh, is unwell. Would you like two weeks work? So I said, yes, I would. And, uh, and I stayed at that company for nine months and then went on and did my first ever drama as a runner. Uh, the first things I ever worked on were sitcoms in, uh, in England. 
And then once I'd done a drama, then I knew that's where I wanted to be. But I wasn't sure what I wanted to be, whether I wanted to direct or produce, probably produce, because the idea of directing slightly terrifying. I'd done a fair amount of it at university and things, but I always thought there were probably people far better at it than me. Uh, but producing did interest me. And, and in fact, on my very, very first day as a, as a runner uh, on sitcoms, I actually, because you, you know no better, do you? I went up to the producer. The company was called Humphrey Barclay Productions. So I went up to Humphrey Barclay and, um, and said, what does a producer do? Which I think is a very, very valid question. And I still think it's a very valid question. And I stick by his answer as well. And what Humphrey said to me was, if everything's going well, very little. But if things aren't going well, people need a decision. And you need to step in and make a firm and clear decision. It might then subsequently prove to be the wrong decision, but at least you gave people a decision at that time. And um, I think that was very good advice. So I started out as a runner in television, eventually got into the BBC, uh, which at the time was a very big organisation, and they did a lot of training uh, and, and worked my way up through the production side. But always knew sort of from then on I wanted to be a producer. And there is the production side of making shows, and that is jobs like uh, well, runners and location managers, finding those locations. First assistant directors, which is scheduling and running the film. Line producers, which is it from a business point of view. So that's the way I want. And there's a parallel world of scripts, script editors, uh, editors and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but I'd gone the production road, which meant I sort of lived life on the road uh, and loved it and always knew I wanted to produce. And uh, uh, but the BBC at the time said, well, if you haven't script edited, you can't produce. And I didn't agree with that. I thought that was wrong. I think there's room for both because I'd seen people who come up through production, produce very well. But also I'd seen people who were script editors come over to producing and know nothing whatsoever about the practical aspect of making shows, very good with scripts, but not a clue about making shows. And I'd sort of had to bail them out a few times. Anyway, eventually I was doing a job called a line producer on a British show called Judge John Deed, which as the name suggests was about a judge. And then I got a phone call from an executive producer saying, would I like to produce the next series of a relatively new then uh, British cop show called Waking the Dead with Trevor Eve, which was a cold case type unit. And I said, oh gosh, yeah, that's what I want to do. Of course, when do I start? And he said, well, we'd want you to start next Monday. So my immediate response was I clearly wasn't first choice then. And uh, I most certainly wasn't, but that was my opportunity. And I grabbed it with both hands and uh, that was many years ago. And so I carried on producing. And then I started doing what's called executive producing for a particular, some particular shows. Uh, and whilst I was executive producing some shows, that company I was working for was bought by Warner Brothers. And then I was approached by Warner Brothers as to whether I would take over and, and, and be in charge of the remakes of, the, of Warner Brothers uh, drama formats, scripted formats around the world. So I said, yes, and it was a real job, it was a proper job, uh, as in it was permanent and it had pension and paid holidays and it was all great fun. So I was involved in uh, or overseeing the remake, so a Russian version of The Mentalist, uh, Two Broke Girls, Russia, ER in uh, Turkey, uh, Pretty Little Liars in Turkey, uh, a couple of shows in Thailand, Gossip Girl, uh, and I think also Pretty Little Liars. So I did that for about three and a half years, but that was a little too corporate for me. So I stepped back out into the world of production fairly recently and uh, did Strike Back, which was a big show on uh, HBO Cinemax and Sky in the UK. And then a couple of years ago, set up All Creatures Great and Small, adaptation of that, and currently doing Alex Ryder. So that's my, that's my background. That's how I got to where, where I am now. So you join me in a hotel room in Evesham, and we've been filming in a massive, massive, massive greenhouse, industrial scale greenhouse or glass house in Evesham of a drone chase where Alex and his friends were pretending it's Holland. We can't actually go to Holland at the moment to film. So we're finding flat areas of the United Kingdom and bits that look like Holland. And we've been, uh, Alex Ryan has been running around the glass house today 
being chased by a drone, both the real one, and then we'll be adding another one later, and being shot at in various bits and pieces. Uh, so so that's, that's where I am, that's who I am, and that's how I've got to where I am today. But when Em at the library contacted me, it was to specifically talk about adapting books uh, for television. And the shows I've worked on over the years, it's been a mix of original shows, new shows, new ideas, and adaptations. And the two most recent ones, obviously, All Creatures Great and Small, uh, adapted from the, the stories of James Herriot, a vet in Yorkshire, 1937, in the United Kingdom. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful part of England. Um, uh, uh, a nom de plume, James Herriot, is actually written by a, chuck, a vet called Alf White. And uh, then most recently, the Alex Ryder books, uh, written by Anthony Horowitz. But in the past, I've done a couple of what we would call period shows, big classics. So I did BBC productions of Tom Jones and BBC production of Vanity Fair. So there are some more recent books there, contemporary books and big old period, big wedge books. But they all need adapting. And I suppose that the first question, and it might seem quite an obvious one or perhaps one that doesn't need answering, which is why adapt books? And and from a business point of view, or a production point of view, the advantage of adapting books is that the book, the story, the character, the world, or as we call it nowadays in this industry, the IP, the intellectual property, is known and proven. You're going to be adapting it because it's successful. It's highly unlikely you're going to be adapting a book that wasn't successful. So creating original shows and ideas is great fun but it's risky it takes a lot of time and a lot of money and and it might well fail not because it isn't good it might just be the wrong idea at the wrong time on the wrong channel so as you sort of know in the us from pilot season not everything works but if you adapt a book then you're on safer territory, you're not in safe territory, but you're going to, you're going to be on safer territory. And if you adapt a book, it's highly likely you're going to bring the fans of that book to the show. So there's, there's already, hopefully, uh, 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 already a, a, a built-in audience that are going to come. But you're going to need to attract more people than that. You're going to need to attract more people than got the book out from Rockton Library or purchased the book or anything like that. And attracting that audience. So that's where the key word is adaptation. And that really is, that's the starting point because storytelling on the screen is so different from storytelling in a novel. There, there is, on the screen, there is no inner voice. So a writer in the novel can obviously tell you what that, uh, what the protagonist is feeling. You, you can hear the thoughts in the protagonist's heads. We tend not to do that on the screen. You might have a voiceover or some such, but generally you don't have that. You have to show that. You have to show that through the action that's going on, or clearly the dialogue that's going on. But it is, it's an, audio visual medium and that visual is the key bit it, it's great that there's been such an explosion of people love audiobooks you know yes sure read a book that's fantastic uh, or listen to it as you're driving around or, or doing something uh, and that's an audio version of that of that text but the moment you adapt something for television the word visual comes in and and that is that is key because you can show things without having to tell them. And, and that's part of the key. I think there's a temptation. Sometimes when you, and certainly in first drafts, I can assure you, when you are adapting a book, that you, it can be a bit too wordy. It can explain everything, almost like the novel. And actually, what is there in that paragraph in the novel, perhaps what's there in a whole chapter, can be shown in an action, in a scene. In something they do and something they don't do as in the protagonist so that's that's the, the the main thing is you you it's a very very different way of storytelling and the the writer and the producers but the writer you're making choices right from day one 
what goes in, what doesn't go in, and what you need to change. So that's the challenge. That's the first challenge. And as I say, most books that are adapted are, are going to be popular. They're going to be someone's favorite book. And as you do whenever you read a book, you create your own version in your head. And well, I mean, we all do it. We, we cast it in our head, even subconsciously if not necessarily casting it with Robert De Niro and Michelle Pfeiffer or whoever, but, but at least what they look like, what they sound like. And we almost design it. We, of course we do, we have imaginations. We design it in our heads and we envision it, basically, when you're reading it or listening to it on an audio book. But when a book is adapted and shot and edited and created for the screen, it's not our version. It's not your version. It's not the version you read. It's the, it's the vision of other people. It's the vision of the writer and the director and the cinematographer and the designer and the costume designer and the makeup designer and the uh, composer and all those people. It's their vision, hopefully coming together as one great whole. But it's it's not the one that you had in your head. And, and, and that leads to a, a phrase which we've all certainly heard and possibly used, which is, that it's never as good as the book. I saw the film, it's not as good as the book. I watched the TV show, it's not as good as the book. And I think that can be quite true. I think that can be very, very true. I think there are one or two things where you go, mm, actually, I think it's quite interesting. I think it's slightly better than the book. But for the most part, you go, it's not as good as the book. And I think what we're also saying at that time is it's not as good as the book that I had in my head. It's not, doesn't fit, it doesn't quite match. It's not how I saw it. I didn't see them looking like that. So I think that's where that phrase comes from. And I think you just have to acknowledge that uh, when you are adapting things. You are not going to please everyone. And you probably certainly won't please the absolute aficionados or fans of, of that book. Um, I'd be interested to know, and, and do tell me either in the chat or at the end, if anyone ever felt that an adaptation has been better than the book. Because I think for the most part, people probably prefer the book. Or you're going to get an audience that doesn't read books. They're, they're not interested in the novels. They might go to the movies or, or watch a TV show because they heard that book was very popular. That might bring them to it. But they don't have that novel to compare it to. Um, but seeing as this talk has been organised by Rockland Library, I'm going to start from the presumption that, that most people here are reading novels. And then might, through that, be interested to watch an adaptation of it in the movies. Uh, on a TV show. So I think, forgive me if I keep looking off this way, it's where my notes are. I think the word adaptation, as I say, is key. And, and, and you're making choices from the moment that you start because you are never gonna fit it all in there. And this is a very thin book. Bridges of Madison County, I think is very interesting because that really was a very slight, thin book. Great love story, quite a slight book. And that very easily filled out a very good movie with Clint Eastwood and, and Meryl Streep. And then you get the Harry Potter books, that big, and there's no way that you're going to fit everything that's in the Harry Potter book into a movie uh, that's, a, that's of a normal duration so that the cinemas, the theater, the movie theaters can turn over enough showings in one day to recoup the money. And so on. So you're making the decisions. What goes in? What goes out? What do I change? And I think you have to realize when, when I was a drama student, you, you, everything was always about, you know, uh, when you were rehearsing things or, or, or writing things or directing things as a student. It was a, it, quite actually, it was all about the text and the emotions and the reality of it all. Absolutely no thought whatsoever for the reality that is show business. It's a business. And that's why most of the student plays that I made were probably very, very dull because they were self-indulgent and perhaps not thinking of the audience enough. But the moment you're starting to make television, which is very expensive, and someone or some organization or some channel has put up the money, you have to think of the audience. 
you have to think of the audience and you have to think of sales. That is the reality. It is show business. And of course you want to be making it the best that you can. And for some people, awards are very important or, or getting a good review is very important. And for some people, and I've worked in that corporate world, it's just the figures, just the sales figures. That's it. That's the most important thing. But it is show business. That is what we, that is what we do. And you want your show to succeed. It needs to make money. It needs to sell. And for that, you have to think of the audience. You have to know your audience. And you have to know, like a missile, what you're targeting at. And that's the entire audience, not just the fans, as I mentioned at the beginning, not just the fans of the book, but your entire audience, because you need that bigger, you need that bigger audience. So who is your TV show aimed at? What channel is it on? So All Creatures Great and Small, which went out on PBS in the US and did very, very well, but in the UK, uh, it was commissioned by our, our smallest commercial channel, Channel 5. Doesn't usually make dramas. This was their first ever prime time Sunday night drama. So the British public were not used to turning to Channel 5 and watching a Sunday night period drama. That just was not their territory. So the director, Brian Percival, we were very lucky to get on board. Brian had directed... Um, set up and directed the first episodes of Downton Abbey. So it was great to have him on board. And we, we sort of looked at each other because we quite liked the excitement of making something that was for a new channel, in essence, a new channel for this sort of genre. But we said we wanted to make a show that would look at home for the audience, look at home on BBC One, the main BBC channel, or ITV One, the main independent channel. Because that was the kind of audience we wanted to steal. So we wanted to deliver a product for Channel 5 that felt like BBC or ITV. That would be familiar to that audience on a Sunday night and make them come over. So that was our intention. So you have to know who your audience are, what you're, what you're going for, how old are they, and, and wider than that. So here I am talking about a UK show, but wider than that, where's it going to sell? So for all creatures, we knew it was going to go on PBS. They were, they were involved right from day one. British shows usually sell um, to the, what we call the Commonwealth, so Australia, New Zealand, Canada, there's a lot of expats there, they love the British shows, and then in the US, well these days it might be Britbox or BBC America as well, but PBS have always invested, and on all creatures, PBS wanted slightly longer episodes, we had to, we, the, the American version, seven minutes longer than the British version, you guys got the, the deluxe version, British audience, missed out. But there were certain key things we had, as we were making a British show, we had to bear in mind making that show for an American audience. And one of which was uh, Yorkshire accents. Yorkshire accent is very strong, can be very strong. And whilst most British people would understand it, it would, might be quite difficult for an American audience to understand. Also, the story started in Glasgow. James Herriot, the character, like Alf White, the, the originator who wrote books, started in Glasgow, and we had scenes starting in Glasgow with his parents, all speaking in a broad Glaswegian Scots accent. That too could be difficult for an American audience. So we had to reshoot some scenes or do what's called ADR, which is subsequent dialogue recording to make it more, uh, e well, to make it bad sentence for me, sorry, make it easier for an American audience to understand. So in fact, on, certainly on the Glaswegian scenes, there is a British version of the scene that we did using the original sound recordings on the set and the PBS version, which was re-recorded with a slightly lesser Scottish accent. Uh, so that, that's maybe a bit there. I'm not talking about the adaptation of the book itself, but an awareness of, what, of your audience uh, and an awareness of that finished product. Um, I think you also have to think about when your show is for, by which I mean you're making it for now. You're making it for, you know, these days, obviously this year, for 2021. And maybe the book, is much loved, but would feel out of date. And you need to make it relevant slash appealing for a modern audience. You just do. So specifically on all creatures, great and small, great, great, great comic characters. 
But the roles of the women in the books, very, very small. There is a housekeeper, Mrs. Hall, barely features in the books. And even Helen, who is James Herriot's girlfriend, who subsequently he marries, in the books is a very small role. Now, there was a much loved BBC version of All Creatures Great and Small starting in the 80s and ran for 12 years. And the role of Mrs. Hall, the housekeeper, was a bit bigger on that. And Helen, a bit bigger on that. But still, it was dominated by the men. So when we were making that show in 2020, that's not good enough. That is not good enough to represent it that way, and it is not good enough for the audience. So we, we changed, and there's the key word, which can upset some people, but we changed to a certain degree the character of Mrs. Hall, the housekeeper. We gave her a big backstory to do with being divorced, very difficult in 1937 in, in, in England, uh, having a son who was a bit wayward and had gone off the rails, uh, and making her about the same age as Seafried, the vet that owns the house. And Helen, the, the, uh, the girl he falls in love with, we gave her a backstory and more of a role. They were rounded out characters. They were fleshed out characters. They weren't just adjuncts to the men in the story, which is what they really are in the books. So we, we adapted to suit the era. You're making it for now. Again, think of your audience. Think of your sales, it's essential. We also had to look at diversity in the book. The book is set in 1937 Yorkshire. There wasn't much of a diverse population, but we have an obligation. Certainly you have an obligation in, in the UK if you're broadcasting on terrestrial television, you have a legal obligation for diversity in what you're doing. I also think we have a moral one and actually to represent at least represent the makeup of the British public across the board. So you, you can't just bolt that. I mean, you could just do colorblind casting. We can't just bolt it on on that. We had to think of and work out ways in the story to, to show a more diverse world, but to make it feel real for 1937. And we did that in the Christmas episode uh, uh, by, by having... Uh, a lady of, of black origin in the story and actually how we had her in the story is based on the story of, of the actress's mother who had worked in service uh, in Yorkshire uh, and fallen in love with a guy from one of the docks and so we built it in and made it that way again that's a change that's an adaptation to represent the time that we're making the show in. Um, I suppose you can say you get the adaptation of the age that, that it is adapted in. And I think some adaptations now, even of big old period books, feel dated like old movies do. That doesn't mean they're not loved, but they can feel, uh, they can feel dated. So um, TV fashions change, movie fashions change, in the same way that book fashions change. Uh, one of the biggest things to do with adaptations of what you put in, what you change, what you put out, is budget. You can't afford, well, nine times out of ten, you can't afford everything that's, that's on the page. You, you, you know, the novelist doesn't have to worry about the cost of the number of extras or the large battle sequence or whatever it is when you write it on the page. That's the beauty of imagination and just writing it. But if you've got to show it, then, then there, there's a difficulty. And certainly there are some aspects of Addict's Rider uh, with some of the action sequences that were in the original books, we changed. We changed them because we cannot afford to do what Anthony had originally written uh, in the books. Same on all creatures, great and small. Uh, the, the number of characters, great comic Yorkshire farmers, but the number of characters is too many for our, was too many for our budget. And the scale of the Darby summer fair, as described in the books, was never going to happen on our budget, and certainly not because we were shooting it in November. Uh, and um, there was going to be nothing warm and sunny about that, I can assure you. So budget is key, absolutely key. And I think, therefore, you, you have to have the right budget to make a book. If, if, if the book is a massive action, but you've only got a small budget, then are you, are you adapting the right book for that target, for that channel? You're not doing it. A service so budget is is key at times also simplification 
And I don't mean by that oversimplification or making something facile, but at times you do have to simplify ideas to make it immediately understandable in the time that you've got available. Again, as I say, most adaptations, you can't fit the whole book in. So you might have to drop bits and simplify bits. And that happens even on the biggest movies. The movie of Jurassic Park is, is simpler than the ideas and the plot in, uh, uh, in the book, in the original book. And the book itself reads like a movie. I mean, it was, you can see, I mean, I think when Michael Crichton wrote that, he, he knew what he was doing. But the movie is simpler. And you do at times have to simplify things. Action, duration, ideas, what people are describing at times. Um, and you need to, uh, to simplify things, again, for reasons of the storytelling and at times for reasons of the uh, budget. You also have to think about who's going to, who's going to write it, who's going to adapt it. Um, for a long, long time in, in, in the UK, uh, the home of big period adaptations was the BBC. Now it's Netflix, Bridgerton and various other bits and pieces. That's where the money is. The BBC can't really afford to do this. But for many years, that was, that was the home of that. And they sold very well. And there was one man did so many of them, a, a scriptwriter called Andrew Davies, who didn't have that many original hits of his own, but brilliant at taking a very large, fan, you know, historical novel and distilling it and making it simpler, making it fit, and having fun with it. Uh, very, it, it, it's a particular talent. I'm not always sure that the person that wrote the novel, I'm talking about contemporary novels now, obviously, I'm not always sure that the person who wrote the novel is the right person to adapt it. Perhaps, dare I say, they love it too much. We have a phrase that we use, certainly on adaptations, even on original scripts, which is sometimes you're going to have to kill your babies. That's a terrible phrase to use, but by which I mean, there's going to be something you absolutely love about the book or in the script, but you can't do it. It's not the right thing. That also happens when we finish filming and we're in the edit. And there might be the director's favourite shot. Now, we might have got all the toys and the kit out. And there's a crane and a drone and zooming in and all this. And you just go, you know what? It works better without it. And it's very painful, but you've got to get it out. Get rid of it. And the same is true at times with adaptations. So I think you, you certainly need someone who loves that book, but they can also be a bit objective about it as well. Perhaps not love it uh, too much. Um, personally, one of my favorite books ever, I, mean, I suppose I think we all probably have a few books that we go back to and have read a few times. Uh, and one of those for me is Far From The Madding Crowd. Don't know why, I've always loved that book. Uh, perhaps I fell in love with Bathsheba Everdeen. But there was an adaptation in the 1960s with Julie Christie uh, and Alan Bates, I think. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film, but very much of its period. And there was a more recent adaptation uh, with Carrie Mulligan in the lead role. And I love that film. I think it worked for a modern audience. It's a very different take on... Well, it's the same story, but I think even though in Thomas Hardy's book, that Bathsheba Everdeen is a very modern woman and a very independent woman, why should she have to get married to, to, you know, to be justified in society? The, the, the Bathsheba Everdeen who was shown in the 1960s film is very different from the one that Carrie Mulligan showed in the more recent film. Again, it reflects the current period, the current time. So, Another, and do you know another one of my other favourite recent adaptations? Uh, actually, is Great Gatsby. I've always loved The Great Gatsby as a novel. And film wise, I, I did like Baz Luhrmann. I know people are sort of divided on Baz Luhrmann, and, and there's so much of the, the look and the movement and the frenetic things of his, but I did like that adaptation. Again, you can comment away afterwards or let me know whether you did or didn't, but those are ones that I like. I think there's another thing that's quite interesting that's going on now, if we're just talking about television and adaptations, is that original TV shows are being adapted and come back. Perhaps you call them remakes or re-envisaging. But I think that, that all those aspects I've described, you have to go through even if you're remaking an original 
show, if you're bringing Star Trek back or whatever it is, you have to apply those same things. What is the modern audience? Who is that audience? What can we afford? What can we not afford? Um, what are we trying to tell for now? So, you know, did they, that's a very modern take on an adaptation when you are remaking a TV show. But I think it's very similar. I do think it's very similar. Um, let me talk a little bit specifically of, as I say, one of the ones that I've been working on more recently, which was All Creatures Great and Small, which went out on PBS uh, in the US. They are just, well, they're shooting even as we speak, and I know that last week they struggled. So last week up in the Yorkshire Dales, there was snow. It's May, but they had snow. Uh, and obviously that caused absolute chaos for them filming. They will finish filming in June. Uh, it's another six episodes and a Christmas special. Uh, certainly in the UK, we get the Christmas special in, at Christmas. I think you guys got the Christmas special in March and that is of itself quite special, but uh, there's more coming. And I think, certainly for the British audience, adapting those books, very, very popular books, a series of books, James Herriot books, that interestingly enough, were more popular initially in the United States than they were in the UK. When he wrote the books, and he wrote the book because he kept saying, oh, I'm gonna write stuff about the South White, I'm gonna write about being a vet up in Yorkshire. And he got to a point where his wife said, either write the books or shut up. So he did write a book and got it published in the UK. Didn't do much business. But the publisher was quite canny and managed to get it published in America where it topped the bestseller list. And off the back of that, it suddenly became popular in the United Kingdom. But those books are much treasured, much loved. In fact, I can remember growing up that there were copies of those books around. I didn't read them when I was younger. Certainly my parents did, and I think some of my sisters did. Uh, and then the television show, the BBC television show in the 1980s was massive. Big, big show. I mean, you know, one of those Sunday nights, a bit like Downton. Everyone's watching. So to say you're going to make a new adaptation of that, uh, it was very interesting. The moment it was announced, the popular press, certainly in the United Kingdom, were like, oh, how could it ever match the original? How could it? But you have to put all that to one side. You're, you're going to make your own version. And, and in the nicest possible way, we ignored the original TV show and we just went back to the books. And you choose, we were going to be making, as I say, six episodes in a season and a Christmas special. We chose which stories we were going to adapt or build in there. Uh, um, and which ones we wanted to keep for future seasons. And our model was very much actually based on the success that had been enjoyed on another adaptation fairly recently, yeah, that, that in the UK went out called The Durrells, based around Gerald Durrell's books of growing up in Crete in a slightly mad animal-loving family. And I think in the US, I think it went out as The Durrells in Crete, but a very, very, very successful show around for many years that whilst based on the books originally sort of also brought in a lot of original material and made it more appealing as a week by week TV show. And very often that's going to involve a love story. Will they, won't they? And we did that with all creatures. You know that James Herrett is going to fall in love with Helen and eventually they're going to get married. You could just show that as a linear. It's going to happen. The audience knows it's going to happen. But actually, we wanted to have fun with that. We wanted to show a young man, the reality of a young man away from home, away from Glasgow, in the Yorkshire Dales. First job, terrified, learning fast, a steep learning curve like that, and falling in love with a beautiful girl running a farm, who, of course, is going out with the moneyed local landowner. Now, that character that she's in love with, or seemingly going to marry Hugh Holton, he is in the books, but it's a reference about that big. But, but we used that and we took that and we grew that to give it the will they, won't they. And again, that stemmed from the reality of audiences, which is that if you read a book, you pick up a book and you, you're there for the long haul, you're gonna read it in its entirety. 
uh, unless it's awful, in which case you bring it back to the library. But you, you, you're committed to that book. And uh, whether you're just reading it before you fall asleep or the weekend, you're, you're in. But for a TV show, certainly an episodic one, we have to hook you back each week. You, you're not necessarily in it for the long haul. We've got to earn your repeat business. We've got to earn your repeat booking once a week to come and um, to come back, to come and play. Certainly advertisers want that. They want you back each week. And so we need story and we need jeopardy and we need hooks to bring you back in for next week. The cliffhanger, <gasps> will they, won't they? And one of the best people ever to do that was Charles Dickens. And he was brilliant at ending chapters with a hook. And the reason for that was that he didn't publish his, we now think of them as novels. And we had to study them at school. Everyone had to do a Dickens. And you know, there they are, the big old books. But when they were published, they weren't published as novels. They were published in uh, either weekly or monthly, but they were published in magazines. So they were episodic. And so the exact same challenges that we face in wanting you to come back next week, Charles Dickens faced. He, he would have mapped out how the whole story was going to go as he started his new book that was going to be episodic in, in the magazine. Um, but he would also change it as it went. If, if a particular character was proving very popular with the audience, then he brought them to the fore. That's exactly what we do. Um, so I suppose you could say that we're doing nothing more than copying Dickens, which, which isn't bad. But it's exactly that same thing. It's a business. We need you to come back. At the same time, of course, creatively, artistically, we want to be doing the best that we can. But it is a business, and you only get a recommission. You only get season two or season three. If the audience is there, if the viewing figures are there, if the advertisers are there, and, and people come back. So that was very much, that did shape how we adapted all creatures, great and small. On a commercial channel in the UK, it's a commercial channel, there are ad breaks to bring you back the next week. And so, yes, as I'd already explained, we bolstered up the role, the female roles within the show for Mrs. Hall and for Helen. Uh, and I think that worked very well. I do think that worked very well. Um, we gave them proper backstories. We looked at and tried to fit in more diversity as we could. We simplified, we reduced the number of characters. We amalgamated a few farmers. Different chapters of the books had to go to different farmers, but we literally we can't afford that many cast parts. So you do amalgamate and simplify some of those along the way. Shamelessly, we looked at how the Durrells had done it because that had worked well. That was a new, rather than just, a, this is a faithful adaptation of the, of the Gerald Durrell books. Uh, so we did look at that and we followed that to a certain degree as we were adapting. We, we, we added more romance, as I say, intrigue and will they, won't they keep people coming back? Was Tristan going to pass his exams? Was he gonna get rumbled for spending the takings from the veterinary surgery? All those sort of bits and pieces. And, we adapted for the weather. We were shooting over the winter. That affects what we do. That means that as we got through to into winter, there's less daylight. Uh, you know, by 3.30 in the afternoon, you can't film outside because it's too dark. So again, you've got to say that's a great story. And now let's set it in a barn. But we, <laughs> rather than it's out in the field, those sort of things, that's a practical adaptation. But that, that features in there too. Um, the legislation in the United Kingdom for with regards to animal welfare and animal husbandry uh, is these days quite rightly very very tight and therefore there's a limit to what you can and can't do now with animals working with animals on a film set the back when they made the show in 1980 I can assure you didn't exist so what that meant was when the the, the show which is about a veterinary surgeon veterinary surgeon when he need we needed to see procedures on animals you can't do procedures on animals anymore. So you end up building prosthetic bits of cow. We built a cow's rear end for a whole birth seat in episode one. We built a cow's 
sort of from the, the neck down to the chest for an operation in one of the later episodes. And those things are expensive on a show that had quite a small budget, probably smaller than people thought it was by the look of it. And so that of itself will shape your adaptation. Uh, you're looking at, you know, shows where we needed the beautiful countryside. Luckily, that's fairly free if the weather's good. But the animals, quite expensive. So again, you have to, you have to, you're shaping your adaptation to do with that. And I'm just looking at the time now. Well, it's quarter to nine here. And the book that I'm working on now, well, the adaptation, Alex Ryder. I'd never read any Alex Ryder novels when I was approached about making this. But my son, Inigo, had devoured them. Not all of them, but there'd been a period when he just went going through them and loved them. So I knew they appealed. I knew they were very, very popular. And then I think he kind of grew out of them. I mean, the books have been written over a 20 year period. The schoolboy doesn't really grow up in them, but, um, but, but, uh, and I knew there had been in the early 2000s, a movie version of the first one, Stormbreaker, that had not gone well. It was, I think it was made by Miramax, but it was too sort of high concept, too much, too much like a sort of a camp James Bond movie rather than realistic with its feet on the ground. So when Sony Pictures Television, who own the company where, that makes it, uh, wanted to make it, it, very much it was going back to the books, which is, yes, of course, you know, it is a schoolboy that ends up uh, in spy capers for MI5, British Secret Service. But at the same time, it's got to have its feet on the ground. The foundations have to be strong. He is also a schoolboy who hasn't done his homework, hasn't learned his lines for the school play, and he's wondering if that girl over there fancies him. And so it was very key for us that that aspect, those foundations were strong. Now off the back of that, season one had uh, school children being cloned in a school in the Swiss Alps. And season two, why well, I'm not gonna tell you what, but we have similar high concept ideas, but the foundations have to be strong. So it's been very interesting on this one because Anthony Horowitz, who wrote the books, um, it's his wife's production company that make the show. So Anthony is around, Anthony is involved. He doesn't write the scripts, but he's very heavily involved with Guy Burt who adapts and writes the scripts. And Anthony Horowitz is a very clever writer. He's a prolific writer, he's a workaholic, but a very clever writer who writes both novels and very successful novels for the James uh, for the James Bond estate. Uh, he also writes Sherlock Holmes novels as well as his own original ones. But he is also a screenwriter, and created Foil's War, uh, and a variety of other TV shows. And if I say he's not precious about his books, I don't mean that dismissively. What I mean is he acknowledges it's a different kind of storytelling. That what he wrote in the books. What is going on in Alex's mind is very easy to write on the page. But to get that across uh, in, a, in a, on a TV adaptation is a different discipline. So he's very open to that. They are not direct chapter for chapter adaptations of his books. We make eight episodes in a season. It goes out, as I say, on Amazon. Prime in England, Europe, Australia, and other countries, and IMDb TV in the US. In a very, 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 these days, competitive market for action adventure for, uh, for young adults and people up into their 20s. Very interesting, the, the, the audience is wider than you might think, and I suspect that's because I say the books have been written for 20 years, so I think there's a lot of older people, I use the word older, advisedly, uh, coming back to look, to, to watch an adaptation of, of the books maybe they liked. But it's very competitive. You you have to hook people back. You you know what it's like if you're watching Netflix. Um, over the years, as I've made TV shows, and when you're editing a TV show and the executive producers are crawling all over the edit, people concentrate on the first 20 seconds, like their life depends on it, because that's where you've got to hook them. And then they'll concentrate on the last 30 seconds, because that's where you've got to hook them ready for the next episode. And, and that is different from a book. And, uh, and, and that's, I suppose, where the word adaptation is very easy to view the word 
adaptation in a negative way because you're taking that precious text, maybe someone's favorite text, changing it possibly for the worse and removing their favorite bits. But also I think it's quite possible to see the word adaptation in a, real, in, in a realistic way, which is you have to change that story to fit the medium that you're making it for, for the period that you're making it in, and for the business side. And that is, that is the reality. Um, uh, that, that we do. Um, one last thing I'll just add before I finish waffling, which is I, I said a little earlier that I worked for three and a half years for Warner Brothers International Television Production and involved in the remakes of shows, Warner Brothers properties, uh, scripted ones around the world. That was fascinating too, because again, it was adapted. But for that, when, when the world of TV formats suddenly became big, big business, and, and it led with game shows, because it's very easy to take a game show that's successful in one country, you sell it as a format with exactly the same music and set and lighting. And they play around with massive business. And then people thought, well, you can do the same with scripted shows, and sell those and have those remade in other countries. And originally, basically, that was a case of selling a script, translating it and saying, make it like this doesn't work that way, doesn't work that way at all, because culturally we are all so different. If you're going to make a, a local language version of something, you have to make it for that culture. Um, and I think a very interesting example of that was Pretty Little Liars, a show I was not familiar with at all beforehand. I generally don't watch American teenage dramas, but I did when I had to. And then we remade that in Turkey. Now, what is acceptable in a US teenage drama, I can assure you, is not acceptable in Turkey. So episode one of Pretty Little Lies, uh, one of the main protagonists, I think has had a row with her parents. She goes to a bar for a drink. She meets a very good looking guy in a drink, in, in the bar. Uh, clearly they like each other. And then you see a sequence where they're out the back, around the back of the bar kissing, and it would suggest that they are, that they're going to have sex, or perhaps they do. And the next day, the girl goes into school, and there is a new maths teacher, and he comes in, and who should it be? But <gasps> it's the guy from the bar last night. How very awkward! Now, I can assure you, if you're adapting that for Turkish television, it doesn't work like that. The themes and the dramas of, of what's going on, and the confusion, and all the rest, universal. That can go anywhere. But certainly in Turkey, that's not going to happen that way. So, what was high school kids in? The US drama was university students in Turkey. And certainly the girl, after having had a row with her parents, did not go to a bar. She went out to a park and ended up chatting to a man, a young man on a park bench. And they most certainly did not end up kissing and potentially making love. They smiled at each other. And the shock horror thing when she went in the next day, and he was the new lecturer at university, exactly the same drama you could not have anyone, you couldn't have any alcohol in any scene. And that was a changing environment. You could when they shot it, but by the time it transmitted legally, you couldn't, so that all had to be painted out. And I suppose I, I, I mentioned that, that's not adaptation of books, that's adaptation of other television shows, but the same rules apply. So in taking those US shows and taking them abroad to other countries, yes, Warner Brothers is a big global brand selling these things around the world. But the key thing was to act locally, to target and to know the audience for that culture and that country. And that's the same when you're adapting books. And there's a saying in this industry, which no one knows anything, by which I mean, you can work on something and you can make something and you think it's gonna be fantastic and it fails. And there's other stuff I've made where I think, well, it'll be all right, and it succeeds. And that happens in the movies, and that happens in television. If we all knew the secret success for making it work, we'd all be multimillionaires. But you do the best you can. You do it in the time constraints that you've got. You do it for the budget you've got and for the audience and the sales that you are targeting. And if all that works, then that's very good. 
I think I've said enough. And um, I hope I haven't bored you all. Um, it's, it's five to nine here. So, and I think it's mid-afternoon for you guys. Em, do you want to, with regards to questions, do you want people to put them up on chat if people have got any questions? Or do you, do we ask people to unmute and ask questions? Excellent. It is up to participants, whatever they feel more comfortable with, whatever you want to do. If, if anyone's got any questions, and that includes my family that are watching, who, are, who at last have worked out what I do for a living, uh, you can ask any questions you like, or perhaps you haven't got any. Would anyone like to ask any questions? Please don't feel that you have to at all. Any questions? No. I hope you've all enjoyed it. I have a question. Hi, Mike. Hello. Yes. Did you ever consider having any of the original cast make a cameo in the new one? Of all creatures? Yeah. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and we considered it very, very hard. That came up. There were two aspects of that, Mike, that came up in discussion in pre-production. One was the use of the original music because the, the theme tune, da, 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 oh God, I can't even remember it now, that's really bad. I can only remember our new one, was very iconic and, and was well known and much loved. And if you played that theme tune to anyone, certainly in the United Kingdom, they would know that was all creatures great and small. So that was one of the first questions is, do we try and license and use the original music? And do we do a cameo of, from one of the original cast members. And that went round and round and round in circles. And we did approach some of the original cast members. Uh, we approached actually, I think we approached all the original cast members that, that were still alive, Robert Hardy who died. Um, just to, uh, almost by way of courtesy, say, look, we are making this show. And ultimately we decided not to go for any cameos with people in season one. And we added the original theme tune to the closing credits of the UK version only. And the reason why we didn't, in the end, approach any of the original cast members and to ask them to vaccine a cameo was for us, the shadow of that original production was over us the whole time. We knew we would be compared to it in the press and in the audience's minds. But we felt that we had to be standing on our own two feet as our own new production. And that if we sort of had a nod or an homage or a wink at the audience and brought in some of those original cast members, we would be connecting ourselves too much to that original one. So that was up for discussion. That doesn't mean they won't be in future seasons, because I think now that, that the new production was, was very successful and can stand on its own two feet. Uh, and then with regards to the theme tunes, I say we added that to the end of episode one of the UK version. Ah, uh, that was a decision ultimately made by the executive producers. I was in favor of not doing that for exactly the same reasons. Um, but it went down very well and it was mentioned in many of the reviews. But no, ultimately we didn't go with that idea, Mike, but I can assure you there was much coffee drunk and many discussions about that would you have liked to have seen maybe yeah, the, re the reason i ask is i have to admit i never watched the original until i watched christopher timothy um uh, do his road trip yep uk for two seasons i said geez i gotta go back and see if i could find this and of course we did it's on acorn yep and watched them all so yeah you know you're, there is, i don't think i would have heard it all personally because Did, my, you know, why yeah, can't it going through the through the road trip shows? Yeah, it's interesting. There was um when I was growing up, there was an adaptation of Winston Graham's novels Poldark, which was very, very successful here. And then fairly recently there was a remake of the novels of Poldark. And in the very first episode, they had the actor from the original series, the guy that played Poldark, an actor called Robin Ellis, who was a heartthrob at the time. They had him as a vicar. At a church service and as the new hunky pulled up came out of the church he shook hands and said many thanks to the vicar for the service and that for those that knew that was the original pulled up being thanked by the new pulled up um and there was no you actually got picked up everywhere and all the press and all the rest and it was almost like 
and and I, I it was almost that was the attention of it. But it worked in, in the drama itself. It worked. It was sweet. You know, it didn't it didn't do it. So it, yeah, it, it it was a decision we made not to, but we went round and round in circles on that one. Well, personally, it worked. So I'm glad. <laughs> it, I'm glad there are going to be more. Cool. I've got a. Ha, I've got a question that's come up on chat. Have you ever taken two characters from a book and turned them into one for the adaptation? Most definitely. Um, yes, we have, and and also done that in a in in a a film that was not an adaptation of a book, but it was a film about Mary Whitehouse. Uh, now, in the UK, Mary Whitehouse, very well known, she was a, a, a campaigner in the late 60s into the 1970s for decency and standards on television. And she took the BBC to task. And I did a single film for BBC Two about that with Julie Walters playing Mary Whitehouse, which was fantastic. But we certainly took a couple of characters that had existed in the real world and who had, had battle with Mary Whitehouse. Uh, over decency and standards on television and amalgamated them into one character. And again, that was for simplification. And rather than having two characters there, it just allowed us to boil their, their adversary the, yes, towards her and those ideas down into one. Uh, so yes, I've done that. And also that has happened in, yes, have done that also on, on scripted ones. Certainly in Tom Jones, I think we did. Uh, and certainly in all creatures, there were a couple of the farmers that sort of got amalgamated. Um, and that was cost, I'm afraid. That was just, that was cost. Um, and also I think then you haven't got a whole, yeah, some shows you, you you know, a big show, you need, and I know, I'm sorry I'm waffling now, but I know they've done that on quite a few of the Dickens adaptations because there are so many characters in Dickens. And for Norton, sorry, who's that? What's that? Who's that? Another person in a powdered wig? Who, what? So I think at times, yes, you do do that. And I've certainly done that. Um, uh, and I think we've even done that in the Harry Potter ones as well. You know, there are times when you just, you do that for simplification reasons. Um, any more questions? Anything else? No, I'm looking at lots of blank screens. Anything else? I hope it's been oh guess, mike hi again yeah i guess your family knows what you do they're not asking you any questions do you know what mike i'm not even sure they're still there they probably will put the kettle on having a cup of tea there you go they they they're sick and tired of my voice waffling well thank you very much you're very welcome mike you're very welcome i hope uh, people have enjoyed it and um and it has been interesting thank you very much that was very good Ah, uh, I recognize that voice. Thank you. Thank you. This is really enjoyable. Excellent. Well, if anyone has, if no one else has a question, I think that'll do it then. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you so much to Richard for a really fascinating talk. And uh, have a good night and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Good Cheers. Bye.